everyone. Rich Hagen here welcoming you to day two of Pro Tour Theros 2013. It's been an amazing day one, and we're about to do it all over again. Three rounds of draft, five rounds of standard. It's going to be absolutely tremendous. What I want to do first of all is take you to the overnight leaderboard. So let's show you what the shape of day two is going to start looking like. Who are we looking at as the very, very top players? So what we're going to see is at the very top of the standings, here we go, Paul Rietzel of the United States, 8 and 0. Sam Black of the United States at 8 and 0. Then you have every 7 and 1 in the building all on your screen right now, headed on tie breaks, which don't mean a lot at this stage, but will eventually at the end of the day. The likes of Dizani, Makahida Mahara, the 2006 world champion. Lucas Tajak, who's a bit of an unknown from Germany, been around on the European uh, scene, has a Grand Prix top eight to his name. Lucas Yaklovsky, top eight from Worlds 2010. The amazing John Finkel with his 14 Pro Tour top eights. David Kaplan, creator of Canadian Threshold in Legacy. Then you've got Pierre Dajon of France. Raymond Perez Jr., he's at his first PT. Alexei Shasov of Russia is seven and one. Our own, on coverage, Matei Zatelkai from the Slovak Republic. Kentaro Yamamoto, qualified through Magic Online, but with a tremendous record in Paper Magic as well. Carlos Duarte, relatively unknown again from Portugal. And Michael Derzo, who I believe has an amazing standard deck, which Brian David Marshall will tell you a little bit about later on today. And then John Stern, where he heads the six and twos, of which there are many, many, many on six and two. Uh, so that's the leader. Board. Um, and for those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. It's great to have you with us. We know that magic's growing at a stupendous rate all over the world. I've been joined by Zach Hill. Um, and Zach, let's just take people through what they're going to see today in terms of the schedule and the formats and so on. So we begin, we began yesterday um, with draft, of course, and they play three rounds of Theros. Let's take a look at the schedule and formats as we head uh, down here for you. So it's draft, three rounds, then rounds four through eight was standard. Uh, and then, Zach, what are we going to see today? Yeah, so, I mean, we're going to take a look at uh, Theros Booster Draft. My mm -hmm. favorite part is being able to actually sit and watch the draft. I believe we're going to see Paul Rietzel under the spotlight. Uh, we have to confirm that or whatever, but uh, that should be really exciting yep. to watch. And then we're going to see five whole rounds of standard. So that's 12 to 16. Yep. Rounds 12 to 16 mm -hmm. of the really the highest performing breakout decks. And there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the standard format that I think might take some of our viewers by surprise. Yeah, one of the classic sort of uh, sort of good against evil almost thing is you've got a sort of mono red devotion deck right. potentially lined up against a mono blue devotion. Yeah. Deck, um, which is going to be fantastic stuff. Um, so then on Sunday, they come back. They play the best three out of five. Uh, this time, it's top eight. It's standard all the way down the stretch. And tomorrow, best three out of five there. So that's the schedule. That's the format. Um, now, what about scoring, Zach? Because it's a little bit arcane. It's not just you win, so it counts as a win. Uh, tell us about the scoring. Right. Uh, for those of uh, you know people that have been playing tournament magic for a long time, this will be pretty familiar. But uh, if you're sort of new to the tournament scene, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. A win is worth three points. So when we're talking about, you know, this person has 24 points, 21 points, that's what we mean. If you win, you get three points. The goal is eventually to accumulate the most points. Now, if you draw a game, mm -hmm. that can mean that either one person wins the first round and the second person wins the second round and then the third goes to time. Sure. It could mean that, uh, you know, players agree to intentionally draw. Right. And then there are some effects that, like, damage both players. So if that keeps happening over and over again, that's another way to get a draw. Okay. That's only worth one point. Okay. So it's much so, worse. So Raphael Levy, points. for example, has five yeah. wins, two losses, and a draw coming in right. today. So that's 16 points, three lots of five, and then your, your one extra point for the draw. All right, that's fair enough. Now, what are we playing for? Talk us about the prizes, because it isn't just about pro points. It isn't just about the cup and the glory. There's some hardcore cash going on here. Let's take a look um, at our prize list uh, here at Pro Tour Theros. And it stretches all the way down here to 75th place. There you see, if you finish 75th, you're going to get a 1,000 bucks for your pains, not to mention the five pro points. And as we head up, it starts getting pretty serious. And you see the big shelf between sort of 17th, where you're going to be two and a half thousand dollars, and then top 16, 5k. Once you're into the top eight, 
tomorrow. That is some serious money. And eventually someone will walk away with 40,000 US dollars. And in terms of qualifications, let's just take a very quick look about how the players got here. There's a bunch of ways. Let's whistle on through them. Yeah, so uh, the first thing you do is win a Pro Tour qualifier. These are tournaments in your local area. Okay, so that's about 50% of the field. Then you get a high finish at Grand Prix, and that's based on attendance. So it might be the top four in a small Grand Prix or top eight in a large one. Yeah, okay, you can get top 25 at the previous Pro Tour. We want to keep the people that are doing well on the train to see them under the lights again. Okay, then next we have top four finish at the World Magic Cup. So Hungary, Iceland, Czech Republic, and France. If you're not in the Hall of Fame, like France's captain. Indeed. Uh, you can win the Magic Online Championship Series. Mm -hmm. We like to bridge sort of the online world and the real world. Sure. And you could be a Players Club member, so that basically means a Platinum, Gold, or Silver Pro, which will have different benefits, but that's a little bit arcane for 9 o'clock in the morning. What else? And finally, you can be a member of the Pro Tour Hall of Fame. Uh, who are doing very, very well at this tournament. It turns actually. out they really, really are. Well, <laughs> Zach and I will be with you through the morning, bringing you lots of great stuff on draft. We've got a very important announcement at lunchtime with Mr. Aaron mm. Forsyth, the director of R&D. You won't want to miss that. Lots of good stuff from Aaron coming later. But the great news is that everyone got up bright and early here in Dublin, ready to bring you the best drafting action in the world. We are heading to pod one, and we are heading to one of the co-overnight leaders, Paul Rietzel of the United States. States. Let's get you down to the booth. It's time to draft. Hey guys, welcome to the booth. Marshall Cycliff here with Brian David Marshall. And morning. It's draft time, buddy. Yeah, it's morning. We, we normally draft all night, but uh, <laughs> I'll accept some draft viewing early in the morning. We're getting a chance to watch Paul Rietzel draft here. I, and I gotta tell you, that's a, that's a tough choice because we also could have looked at Sam Black, but we're going to see what Paul Rietzel does when he opens his Theros pack, right? Now. Marshall, it is the draft portion. So day one is behind us. Two players left standing undefeated, and they're both in this draft pod. You see Paul Rietzel with his arms crossed there looking pretty stern. He's ready for business. And directly right. across from him is Sam Black in the same pose. They're both sitting at 8-0. and <clears throat> And uh, this draft is going to be a big stepping stone toward, towards their bid for top eight right. here. And we see three Star City Games team members sitting mm. at this top table. Uh, also, you know, notably uh, sitting there is, you know, Pro Tour Hall of Famer, all-time great John Finkel. That's right. I also see Lucas Yaklovsky at the table, uh, along with, uh, there's David Kaplan, I believe. Yeah. Pretty stacked table. Makahito Mahara, yeah. someone who was in uh, a lot of people's uh, Hall of Fame discussion this year. Yeah, this is an absolutely you know, stacked table. Getting himself pod. in a position for a fifth top eight. Mm -hmm. Which he... is, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's... that's where you're, you start to get a little undeniable. <laughs> A.K.A. 3,000 hits. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, so we're going to be watching Theros draft. This is the second draft me, of the weekend. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you're not really able to hear it on, on the thing, but the, the flick, 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 flick sound of the first round of draft, how does that sound hit you? Oh, I love it. Let's take a look at uh, at Fall's opening. He's he's pulled a Heliod's Emissary to the front. I also see that there's a Polis Crusher in the pack, yeah. which is an incredibly powerful card. Two black cards, Disciple of Fenex and Sip of Hemlock. Uh-huh, both that, solid cards. Is that a, is that an Erebos' Emissary, or is that... Uh, that is a Nidea's oh, no, no. Emissary and a Horizon Chimera, I believe. This pack is very, very strong. A lot of places to go, but I don't know, if, if it's me, BDM, I'm slamming that Polis Crusher. I've played against that card, and it is mean. It, 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 it's brutal. Protection from enchantments uh, has a lot of hidden implications in this format. It does. Things that you're like, you can't block that. What? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, you can't kill that with your Spear of Heliod. Yeah, yes. And, uh, that came up the other day. Did it? Now, the thing, interesting thing, though, is that it is a gold card, yeah. which is Red -green. not the most desirable on your first pick. But uh, when it's that powerful and asks that little of you, it, that's what you usually want to be doing. So we see a Lash of the Whip get served. Well, there, there's the Erebus' Emissary. Yeah. Oh, there's a Wingseed Rider. That's, that's a huge signal pick, too. It can be. Yeah. I mean, I, I assume that the rare's gone. I haven't seen the rare yet. If the rare's gone, you kind of, it could be anything. It could be anything, Yeah, sure, it could sure. be Elspeth, you it know, It could be whatever. Elspeth, it could be Angel of Fate, I mean, Agent of Fate, it That's could be right. Fabled Hero. Yes. 
Celestial Archon, that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. It looks like he pulled Triton Fortune Hunter to the yeah. front. So let's see how this, uh, how things unfold here for, for Paul Rietzel. 3 0 his draft pod yesterday, then went 5 0. Staying relatively open here early. Ooh. Uh, we'll talk about strong signals. Jeez, Gray Merchant of Asphodel, one of the most powerful cards in the format, really pushes you hard in a direction. And getting one third pick, yeah, that is a sign. And there's, you know, there's a rescue from the underworld that, oh, but he shuffles it back. Mm. See, he's looking at Agent of Horizons to the front currently. That doesn't mean it's what he's going to take, but it is what he has pulled to the front. I'm curious, really curious to see what he takes here. Though, <laughs> all right, we're going to get uh, our floor spotter, Tim hey, Willoughby, Tim down there. All right, he did take Agent of Horizons. Interesting. So that is that is going to be a uh, a huge, uh, <laughs> you know, the, basically the two like commons that really want to drive you in the direction of a deck have gone by in previous packs. Like, what kind of signals are you know, going downstream from Paul? Yeah. So there we see a uh, Triton Wave Crasher. Wave Crasher Triton, sorry. Yeah, Wave Crash Triton. So this could be a pretty good position to be in. If you're blue-green, you have uh, the ability to splash quite easily. Right. And blue-green's a powerful component uh you know the blue blue has cards it has a lot of tempo and bounce plays that you can make and the best time to do those is when you have big green creatures that can really capitalize right. and close the door before your opponent can catch up and you can, and you can often get like late pick like centaur battle masters and and things like that yes you can get those for sure also nessian coursers tend to hang around a little longer than yeah. i'm comfortable with i always take them there's a sedge scorpion in there i'm a big fan of sedge scorpion and there it is. Goes goes up to the front. I see he's also got a crackling triton. If he is considering a red, I feel, I feel like I feel like blue reds right open. You see the Camara back there too. Uh huh. That's a card you can get late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that blue red is is mm -hmm. certainly yeah available. We saw a Ben Stark yesterday draft blue red. Had a pretty decent first pack, a mediocre second, yeah. and the third pack was ouch. We're gonna see what happens for Paul here. The stymieing of hopes. There's another Agent of Horizons in this pack. Okay. That's a late <laughs> fanatic of Mogus. You, you, you see that the <laughs> Boros at heart, Paul Rietzel can't help but pull that <laughs> fanatic of Mogus to the front here. It, I, I would be hesitant to call that a signal at this point, but it looks like Paul thinks it is. And well, he's he can, still, he can it. still be green red. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah, yeah. He has a Triton Fortune Hunter and. I mean, at worst case, you can go without activating your Agent of Horizons. Yeah, yeah it's, a th it's three power for three mana. That's fine. Yeah. There's a Destructive Revelry. Yeah. Looks like he's pulled that to the front. He's already passed one of them, but he's got a Commune with the Gods here. Commune with the Gods if you want to go for a Dredge-like strategy or mm -hmm. a Spider-spawning-like strategy where yeah. you fill your graveyard up for... Uh, recursion effects and yes. for uh, Nemesis of Mortals. Yes. That deck never works. <laughs> <laughs> By the way. <laughs> just, just an FYI. Yeah. I know that you've done the necessary <laughs> yeah. research. <laughs> yeah. Y y you'll notice a correlation between me winning this weekend in our drafts and stopping <laughs> that. <laughs> that <laughs> trying to force that archetype. You've been drafting really good decks. Here's an omen speaker that Paul has, but I think he's going to take a shredding wins here. Yeah, just uh, a, a really good sideboard card. Yeah. And, and it is a sideboard card in this format. Yeah. There's formats where you'll play a card like that main, but generally M14. speaking, you won't. Yeah, M14, <laughs> you are plummeting and all that. But I think that for the most part, there's Shredding a, Wins has been relegated to the There's a two-headed Cerberus. Uh-huh. And Paul's going to take it. Which I always want to say Cerebus because of the comic book. Yeah, uh, maybe that's why I always wanted to say it. Somebody finally corrected me. I was actually saying that at the GP. Yeah, it, 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 the, the comic was supposed to be called Cerberus, <laughs> but he <laughs> misspelt it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. All right, so Paul's got a few red cards here. Oh, his, wow. His, wow. Bernard, uh, Elmer's girlfriend there. Yeah. <laughs> I think he took the Minotaur, yeah, Minotaur Skullcleaver there. 
That's a very aggressive the, red card, and I, I think that Paul feels like red is is pretty open. Red, and, red, and look, red looks in. wide open. He, yeah, I mean we're not seeing lightning strikes come around, but good creatures. No. What did he take there? He took a Portner Betrayal. Okay. Portner Betrayal, totally playable card. You do need the right uh, the right deck to back it up, but it it does its job. Look at all these red cards left, although I wouldn't say Boulder Falls is necessarily <laughs> Somewhere super LSV's high like, pick. must be nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, LSV, we had him on camera yesterday. He had a pretty grindy blue-black deck. I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, his deck yesterday. Look, right? Is that the other destructive arm? It is, come back yeah. around the table? Yeah, and the Chimera goes last year. So, so Paul, this is going to be which, interesting. Which Chimera went last? Was that the, sp the Spellheart? The Spellheart, mm -hmm. yeah. So let's take a look at, at what Paul's got here. He's, he's going to get a chance to, to thumb through his uh his pile of cards as he hits the hits the goods there all right so let's see what he's got also hitting the goods yeah yeah polished crusher you know green red green red there's a little bit of blue in there but i really do feel like he's polarized over to green red here yeah yeah he 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 picked up those later red cards and i think he said all right i've had enough i've had enough with this blue and frankly his blue's not that good you know a uh, wave crash triton a triton fortune hunter those are fine cards but they're not reasons to jump ship or to, right. to splash he, or he need he needs some stuff to happen now cuz he he yeah. does not have he does not have the the foundation for some you know, it's not like you're like, okay, I got one lightning strike. I mean, Polish Crusher, obviously, just, you know, a, a house. Mm -hmm. it but, is. But, but but apart from that, it's, yeah, it's a he, little bare bones. He, he has right a now. lot of filling out to do. Yeah. Yeah, he does. He needs, Actually, he needs he some has ill -tempered a, He has a lot of the filling out already covered. Uh -huh. He needs a lot of the uh, the skeletal structure. Yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, I feel like he's. When you think well, about he, the staples for the green red deck, he doesn't have that many but, of them. How many Nessian Aphs, Ill Tempered right. Cyclops? All right, let's see what he picks There's up. There's a Nemesis though. of Mortals. That's a very, very strong pick for his deck here. And there's, and the there's lightning a Lightning st Strike. So he's actually got a pretty tough pick between Nemesis of Mortals and Lightning he's Strike. He's taking here. Lightning Strike, right? Like I think he is. I think there's an argument there, but I, I think I like Lightning Strike too. What would you take, Ooh, BDM? I, I would take Lightning Strike, but now he's, he's flipped around to the fatty. Yeah, it's this is not an easy decision. Nemesis Immortals is very, very strong and does a lot of work in the yeah. deck. And sure enough, he takes it. And, and this is an interesting thing you see. Like I think in most draft formats, that lightning strike would be a windmill slam. Mm -hmm. But the removal is really a little tricky in this format. It really is. You know, either the the, you know, the the removals that do four are too expensive to deal with the small stuff. Mm -hmm. The removal that deals three or two is quite often just too small to deal with the monstrous stuff. Yeah, it's true. And yeah, so you, lightning you, strike is one of the ones that actually lies in that middle ground where it actually hits where you right. you know you can kill an ill-tempered cyclops with two mana at instant speed. That's pretty nice. Uh, there's, there's some 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 good red cards here for him. An arena athlete. I see a Perforos's yeah, emissary. Yeah, Perforos's here. emissary. That card's fantastic. Yeah, I feel like the emissary is what Paul's going to gravitate. Oh wait, towards. look at this. He's looking at the Nylea's disciple. Nylea's disciple. Yeah. Another Agent of Horizons, which he pro probably knows he can wheel. There's yeah. the. I'm just the, taking that emissary myself. Let's see what Paul thinks. He's he's definitely looking at all three. The arena athlete's really sweet too. And there and there's two minotaurs in this pack also. Like mm. there's one in the back. But yeah, he takes And there it is, a disciple. So Paul says, remember I talked to him on the desk yesterday. He said he felt really comfortable. And I uh, felt like he knows the format pretty well here. So the tech here, Nylea's disciple. Yeah, games it's a good card. People are playing it in constructed. Mm. <laughs> Titan strength. Oh wow! Wow. Nylea's emissary. I saw a scorpion. Miscutter uh, hydra. Miscutter hydra. Leaf, Titan strength. Leaf crown dryad. This is the one where the guy at F and M goes. Can I just take this pack? Yeah. I'll, I'll take this whole pack, <laughs> Can I just take this and then thing? I won't take any more cards this pack. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, is a draft variant that some people do. Is it that yeah, you can yeah, just yeah, slam the yeah, pack? Yeah. And then you don't get to pick anything. You don't else? get to pick anything else for that pack. <laughs> That's funny. He took the miscutter hydra, I believe. Miss Cutter Hydra, when I first saw it, looked a little bit more like a uh, like a constructed sideboard card, but it, it actually is perfectly efficient uh, for for limited. The can't be counter doesn't come up often. Protection from blue sometimes, but the haste and just being beefy always does. There we go. Ill tempered Cyclops uh, for uh, for Paul Rietzel here. I got to figure that that's what he wants. I mean, if you're going to play the green red monstrous deck, ill tempered Cyclops is what you want to be doing, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean that that card is is just quite. Oh, is that a time, time to, to feed too? Yeah, Ooh, I'm taking time I'm taking, to feed. Yeah, I did not see that. I'm and taking the removal spell that you know as long yeah. as you can go, t you know, a little bit bigger than your opponent's creatures, you can kill just about anything. Yeah, time to feeds time to feed has proven to be a powerful a powerful card for sure. And Paul's quite low on removal. Yeah. He has none. None. So yeah, he's got to prioritize a card like that at this point. All right, he has a... Uh, oh, is that oh. a lightning strike? Yeah, that Jeez. is. Jeez. It's lightning strike and an ordeal of Porphyros. Yeah, very nice. I think lightning strike uh, for, for Paul's deck. He, people because have, he, People he, have really been uh, been moved ordeal ahead of it, even in non-heroic decks right now. Oh, is that right? Yeah, okay. just because he you just... Hey, there you go. You're right, BDM. He takes the ordeal here, so... You put it on, like, a, a said scorpion on turn one, and you end up with a 4-4 mm -hmm. uh, that kills something. Yeah. Or, or, you know, deals some... It, it's... It's it's a pretty solid card, and he still might end up with something like, you know, a uh, staunch heart uh, warrior or something like that. That's true. You're right. He's, we remember this is only pack two here. He's got Nylea's presence pulled to the front. He still has those two agent of horizons floating mm -hmm. around in his deck, so there's a chance he wants to have access to mana fixing for that. There's a portent of betrayal, but he's already got one, so yeah. I think Nylea's he took the presence. Nylea's presence. Yeah, there, he yeah. did. Remember, remember, he's been he's been keeping his eye on blue cards. He's still been willing to, you know, still seeing himself as uh, possibly playing, you know, more than one color. I mean, more than two colors. There's the Seder Piper. I see a fade into antiquity, a wild celebrant. Yeah, so so nothing too exciting out of this pack for Paul. Something he might that might make the deck, but no windmills. Cedar Piper feels like the type of card that Paul Ritzel will wreck you with in limited. He just took it. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, Paul's, he has an interesting take on this deck. He took Ordeal over Lightning Strike. I, I think that's right. Wow, yeah. I've Maybe I'm a little, maybe I'm a step behind. I'm still taking Lightning Strike. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm you... the Lightning Strike guy. I love that card. Wow, look at that, uh, that, that Minotaur Lord there. Mm, yeah, Craig Mawar Caller. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a Seder Rambler here. How, how do you feel about the red black Minotaur deck? Uh, I played it a couple of times. I've never I, I played against it, I should say. I've never played with it. And it seems sweet. Yeah. I mean it, you need it, the pieces. It was, I think it was open at this table for sure. Yeah, it was. There's a lot of Minotaurs. There was a Felhide Minotaur in that last pack as well. Uh Wild Celebrants. I think that's a Borderland Minotaur right there yeah. in the front, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. That is a Borderland yeah. Shaman, uh, Borderland Minotaur. Spe it's a Steam Augury. Minotaurs. By the way, there's a Steam Augury that, you know, if it he's could. splashing, if he's going to splash. But uh, I would do it. <laughs> I want to play Steam Augury. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to tap four, man. I don't want a Borderland Minotaur. I want a Steam Augury. Yeah, Borderland Minotaur. Uh, wow, the arena athlete came around the table. Wow, and another Borderland Minotaur. So looks like red is sufficiently yeah. open here. He took the arena athlete. That's really nice. He's wheeled the athlete, and you know this is where like his pick of ordeal over lightning strike is like ah, yeah. that's starting to look a little better. You know, there's another portal patrol. What look, look at this pack? Yeah, four playables. Prescient chimera. And he's just he's just kind of <laughs> hate like, that. Yeah, he's you like, can't. Not I'm not that. giving anybody this. No. Actual. And he's uh, he's in the the later stages of the pack here. So this is this is pack two. If you're sitting yeah. in Paul seat got, BDM, how a, do you feel? I'm feeling a little better right now, just in terms of, of how this has gone. I, I I think there's still, you know, a couple of uh, cards you know you 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 would you would like to have. But I mean, I feel like he's got he's got a little more little more fleshed out deck here. You know, you're probably going to look right now at his mana curve, see where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, see. You know what cards he can cast on turn two, turn three, turn four, yeah, and figure out what he needs to make a priority here in this third pack. All right, so he's quickly thumbing through. So he's got two removal spells. He's got time to feed mm -hmm. and ordeal of Porphyros. Yeah, neither of which I is mean, kind of like just break the glass in case of an emergency and kill something. Not, not even close. Right? They're both like require. Very, very specific game states to execute upon. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if you're going to run that, the Order of Perforos, you you almost are doing it because you want to have access to the counters, and if you yeah. ever crack it, you're like, sweet. <laughs> well, he does have the Miscutter Hydra. He can put it on. Mm, okay. <laughs> so he'll he'll get his lightning strike one way or another here. But I, I bet you the card he would love to open 
more than anything right now is a voyaging satyr. Yeah, he has not seen one. Or even even like option. a sylvan caryatid. Uh huh. Caryatid. Caryatid. Thank you. Caryatid. <laughs> All right, so Paul Paul Rietzel, he's sitting at eight and zero here, <clears throat> and this is the first draft of day two. He is going to his third pack. This is going to make or break his deck. How many right cards now, do you decent. think? How many cards do you think he would take over Voyaging Seder here? Oh, there's probably a few. Um, I mean, he still doesn't have an ill-tempered Cyclops or an Essian Ass, but it's not like he has big mana dumps here yet. Right. Um, so I'm sure there's a few, but uh, it, it's high on his list. There's a coordinated strike. There's another time to feed. There's another lightning strike. Is Paul Which finally going to take one? He's passed <laughs> like three of them or something. I don't know. I might. I might uh, is he going to? Let's see. I mean, time, to, time to, to feed is capable of going a little further up the removal chain. It can, but you need the big monstrous but he's things gonna, yeah, to he's do. He's going to take the lightning strike. All right. He finally took one. He's like, fine. Yeah. Fine, fine. Fine. I'll take it. And we've seen the time to feed go pretty late. Yeah. He, there's a reasonable it's, chance it's he not, heals it's, that. I mean, it seems unlikely, but possible. Agree. I think that time defeat is not an obviously good card either. Like, it does take people a little time. Unfortunately for Paul, well, I should say fortunately, he's sitting at the top table, so yeah. he's not going to get a break on any latent card evaluations here at this uh, pod. All right, a couple of black cards pulled there's in the front. Another oh, there's another time defeat. There's another time defeat. There's a Voyaging Seder. And there's the Nessian ass. Oh, boy. So pretty tough situation here. I mean, for me, I think I like the Asp here because he just doesn't have any of the big monstrous cards, and that's the reason I would play the deck. But I can, I, he does have places to put his mana. <laughs> I say the Nessian ass certainly yeah, makes his... That's uh, what he's taking. Did he, yeah, it makes his time defeats better, too. And we, we were asking what he would take over <laughs> Voyaging uh, Seder. Now we know. Yeah. He would rather have the ramp E than the ramper. Yeah. Which way do you do that? Uh, no, if, it's I mean, early. If, it, if it's if it's earlier, yeah. I would probably take the voyaging Seder uh -huh. and just assume that, you know, Cause these are uh, commons. It's yeah, like, like uh, even if it's not the Nessian Asp, you know, there'll be something like you know, even like a 14th pick Wild Celebrants, like we saw. You know what I mean? There's uh -huh. something that I can put in five. That. Um, and four that'll fill that role. It doesn't have to be specifically Nessie and Asp, even though Nessie and Asp is premium at that spot. Right. Um, the ramp is is harder to find. It is. There's than there's the fatties. Less of that. Yep. So it looks like he's going to take a magma jet here. Bunch of red and green and cards a in the Volpine pack. Volpine Goliath that he can probably count on wheeling the way these this table has gone. There's another Wingsteed Rider. Oh. <laughs> Poor BDM. Every time on? he sees one, it just hurts him. What is, I don't rescue from the underworld. That's like three. <laughs> that's like three gray merchants of Astronel or something. <laughs> I think by my math. Yeah. All right. So Magma Jet here. Solid removal spell. Man, what do you think is going on? Do you think people are like, oh, you know, this? Everyone, everyone knows about the heroic deck. Yeah, that's possible. That is absolutely There's a savage possible. Savage surge. Yeah, looks like he's going to pick that up here. There's, There's a, also a Calmetra a druid. Uh, acolyte. Uh, acolyte. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is a druid. It is a druid. You can ask Rashad. He yeah. can tell you. But it looks like he wants Savage Surge here. Like he's got that pulled to the front. He's thinking though, and I see he's looking at Calmetra's acolyte as well. But yeah, he still doesn't. Oh. 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 Yeah, he's going to go for the acolyte. <laughs> Got to got to cast those Boulder Falls somehow. I mean, remember when he took that uh, disciple of uh, Nylea's disciple yeah. early over the, uh, yeah. the what was it the Cyclops he took it over? Yeah, I think so. There's a Murder King. There's another Savage. There's an Ordeal of Perforos. And an Opaline Unicorn. Yeah, so this is this is going to be an interesting one because it's going to give us an idea. There it is, an Ordeal yeah. of Nylea. He just, he, I mean, he's just, like, he doesn't have a ton of fatty, so he's building yeah. his own. He's building his own, and he's also uh, put shifting the presence of his deck towards the early end. You know, he's got that Arena Athlete and right. a few nice targets early, a Sedge Scorpion. What are the most ordeals you've popped at the same time? I've only popped one at once. <laughs> I, I've had it against me. Um, somebody popped two, but I... Oh, look at that Voyaging Seder. There's a Voyaging but Seder. But now he's... I think he's just windmilling that Seder, but yeah. yeah. Okay. There he goes. Another Gives rescue. us a little... 
Another rescue from Pause the for effect. Mm-hmm. Although we've only seen the one gray merchant. Fine. Yes. So while people have been neglecting your beloved Wingstein writer, it looks like the merchant has gotten yeah. its due respect. All right, here's Paul taking a look. at. Well, that's interesting. A Seder hedonist? Sure. Yeah, I mean, he's in green red, and it can certainly do things. Also, it feels like Paul wants some low drops to There's get those a, ordeals on. A Seder rambler, but like the Seder hedonist lets him uh, ramp into something bigger. Yeah, he doesn't really have, I mean, I think that when we look at it, I'm going to take a he's try got, to find He's him. got like, he's got, a, I'm just saying. He's like, trying to be he's aggressive. Got, he's got like one or two guys if he. Uh-huh. He did take that Nemesis Immortals, right? Yeah. Yeah. Probably probably three guys. <laughs> another, there's another Acolyte. Yeah, he's also got a Spark Jolt that he can consider here. And what is Is that a... Couldn't quite see that other green card. What is that? That's Communion with the Gods. Ah, okay. Spark Jolt it is. He is fairly low on removal here. He's got a Magma Jet, a Lightning Strike, and a Time Defeat, and now a and Spark Jolt. And an Ordeal Jolt. of Porphyros. Yes. And a boulder fall. Is that what he's going to take here? No, I'm seeing he already he does have one boulder. Oh, fall. he's already got one. <laughs> <laughs> he's right. already got one boulder fall. No pick here for for Paul's deck. He just hate drafts black card. Yeah, I'm or sure very possibly you know could possibly play you know, if he feels like he's going to be trading creatures. I mean, so, for, for I, the don't, I don't think he'll need to. No, I see what you're saying though. And he took a battle-wise hoplite. Wow. That's a solid magic card right there. Yeah. But since yeah. it is gold, it goes into mainly just one deck. A gold two drops are pretty demanding. He, all right, he got the two-headed Cerberus back, it looks like. He's looking at that fleet foot sandals too, but yeah, takes the Cerberus. That one never seems to make the cut, but it feels like it would be sweet in this deck. The, the fleet foot sandals? Yeah. yeah. It just never seems to make it. You know, it's a tough yeah. one to fit into your curve, but... He's going to pass two red cards there at the end. It takes table pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that how you say that? It's yeah. Catablepus. Catablepus? Yeah. Catablepus? Yeah. It's a loathsome one, too. Not a nice guy. All right. And there's a commune with the gods at the end. All right. So Paul's deck came out okay. I mean, there were some yeah, interesting it's all, picks there. I, it's, it's, yeah. It's fine. I wouldn't call it exciting. No, no, no. I don't no. think that Paul is going to go back fist pumping to his build table. Like, yeah. <laughs> Check this out, fellas. But at the same time, uh, I don't think he's going to be crushed about it or anything. Though I will say that getting a 3-0 out of that deck, uh, I'd say he'd have to run pretty good to Ooh, do a th that. A 3-0 at, at this deck with the caliber players Hey, guys, welcome back to the booth. Marshall with my David. Marshall. Uh-huh. Right, the what? The caliber players at that table, yes, required to three zero. Yes, also, also is a, is a steep hill. Yeah, oh, of course, and and I mean, but also, I I usually feel like when you have a bunch of really really good players at a draft table, interestingly, the decks end up about like Paul's. It's it's really tough to get a super super good deck at those tables because everybody's kind of covering their own bases right. and nobody's right, right. giving anything away even during the draft. Right, portion. and and it's interesting. Like we we saw the two Wingsteed Riders mm -hmm. go by like in packs one and three, mm -hmm. right? But do you and and we saw Battlewise Hoplite late. But do you feel like you saw her a, a, a heroic deck? No. In no. fact, <laughs> Paul took a couple of early heroic blue creatures, but didn't really see any others. Uh, he had been off of that plan anyway, but there wasn't really much going around as far as that goes. I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that Battlewise Hoplite was still in there. It feels like somebody could have used that. Yeah, like I, I don't, I don't feel like oddly the heroic deck was open. Yeah, it didn't so. seem like it at all. So, you know, we'll have to see. Um, we're going to get a chance to watch uh, Paul play, so maybe his opponent, yeah. you know, will give us a hint. I'm going to I'm going to head out after after we're done in the booth here and go try to find Paul and see what kind of build he comes yeah. up with. I mean, he had some – I, I want to hear what you guys think, uh, you know, on Twitter. Or you can, you know, let us know. I'm curious. There were some interesting picks there. Nylea's Disciple versus the Ill-Tempered Cyclops. Um, what was it that he took over Lightning Strike? He took Ordeal of Perforos over Ordeal Lightning Strike. Ordeal What do you guys think about that pick? There was some right. interesting stuff. I well, mean, he, those he took stuff picks. over two different Lightning Strikes. Yes, he did. So there was some, I think that there's some some discussion to be why, had there why, for sure. Why don't you and I go uh, head out onto the floor? I know we're going to get a chance to cover Paul Rietzel's match. Yes. So why don't we go talk to him, see what some of the people on either side of him were drafting, and send it back to the news desk Let's so do we that. can do that. Yeah, Rich, <laughs> take it away. 
I'm, I'm trying to take it away, Marshall. It's just... It's just too heavy for me. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, welcome back to the news desk. Zach Hill's with me for 35 minutes and he can't escape. Um, so, uh, welcome back. Um, that was pretty interesting stuff and interesting not altogether in a good way. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, Paul knows what he's doing. He uh -huh. is sitting here at 8-0, um, but there's definitely, you know, he passed two lightning strikes for other cards that I don't think a lot of players would intuitively have picked over them. Uh, but, you know, I mean, he's got mana acceleration. He's got monsters. Uh, we'll have to see how it turns out. All right, so first things first, for those of you just waking up, perhaps some of you haven't gone to bed yet because I know it's like five in the morning, <laughs> four in the morning, one in the morning across the United States. So if you're with us, thanks very much. Don't forget, you can see the whole thing again at the very end of the day. We show the whole day through, sort of in a more convenient time zone for some of you. So anything you miss, you can watch again. We're also on YouTube, by the way. Um, now, here's what we're looking at. Let's take a look at the leaderboard overnight. Here we go. You have two players sitting undefeated at 8-0, and, oh, and they are both from Star City Games team. Uh, they spent the week in a castle and it turned out they didn't just sit there um, twiddling their thumbs and enjoying the Irish countryside. They played some magic and they got good fast because they have both got to 8-0, Paul Rietzel and Sam Black. All the 7-1s and ones are on your leaderboard right now. Um, headed on tie breaks by Jeremy Desani of France. We might talk about him in a little bit. Makahida Mahara, your 2006 world champion. Then you've got Tajak from Europe, Yaklovsky Europe, Finkel USA, David Kaplan of Canada on your right. Still all these seven and ones just separated by a few percentage points on tie breaks. Pierre Dajon of France, Raymond Perez Jr. Then you've got Alexei Shasov of Russia, Matej Zadelkai from the Slovak Republic, Kentari Yamamoto of Japan, Portuguese player Carlos Duarte, Michael Derzo of the United States, and John Stern of Canada. And while we've got that leaderboard up there, I just want to sort of explain that basically the way the pods work for draft on day two is it's pretty much in scoreboard order. So you are in fact looking at pods one and two. On the left of your screen is the table that you will have just watched. Paul Rietzel was drafting with Black, Dazani, Mahara, Tajak, Yaklovsky, Finkel, and Kaplan. And pod two is on the right of your screen. Now it turns Turns out, Zach, there are actually some pretty amazing draft pods elsewhere um, in the top tables. Why don't we just uh, talk me through some of the names, for example, at pod three, who have we got there? Well, we've got uh, Chris Calcano, we've got Luis Scott Vargas, Ben Friedman, Uli Rade, Hal Shan Huang, <laughs> Pat Chapin, and uh, you know two other players sitting at six and two, and uh, Luke Southworth and Peter Ingram. Yeah, well done, Luke Southworth, on PT debut, six and two, um, and one of his losses was to John Finkel. So oh, the, yeah. no shame yeah, there. Life. It's fair to say. So that's Pod three. Pod four has amongst others Antoine Ruel, Hall of Famer, William Jensen, new Hall of Famer, Jacob Van Lunen, Pro Tour champion, and Owen Turtenwald, Player of the Year. So there's four monstrous names in that one. What about Pod 5, who have we got there? Big names. Yeah, big names. we got Brad Nelson. We've got a Pro Tour champion, David Sharfman, and a little guy known as uh, Paulo Vitor Damo de Rosa. Yeah, lots of words there, but not as many words in his name as his top eight, is which is <laughs> nine. He has nine Pro Tour top eights, which is just phenomenal. Um, terrific there. You've also got Miguel Gadica, John yeah. Larkin, accelerated back up the field to end up at six and two. Now, the next pod, so you're thinking, these are all now six and two players, but you've got in this one pod... Timothy Simono, team world champion this year with the World Magic Cup. Nico Boni, 2007, team world champion from Switzerland. You have Pro Tour champion from Return to Ravnica, Stanislav Sivka. Then you've got two Hall of Famers, Rob Doherty and Kai Buddha. So, important to remember this, you can only play people within your table of eight and you play someone on the same record. So, in all these eights that we're talking about, one person gets to 3-0. Unless there's a draw in the last round. But basically, one person gets to 3-0. and All these 6 and 2s will be thinking, if I can 3-0 and my pod, I come out of limited at 9-2, and two, then I've still got at least one loss to give. Because if you get to X and 3, 
pretty much you're going to get yourself into the top eight. But if you lose a fourth match, four is the magic number, Zach. That's where things get very tricky. Yes, exactly. And that's, ex you know, why 3 0 a pot is so powerful, because it gives you a little bit of wiggle room in the later rounds. You know, a lot of the time, if you have losses to give, you can intentionally draw. And, uh, you know, you, you, basically your, your tie breaks, too, matter if for, you know, seventh and eighth place, as we frequently see it come down to. So, I mean, 3 0 a pod, huge, huge advantage advantage this early on, but I mean, every one of these pods we've gone through looks like a Pro Tour top eight. Uh, and we've so, even got a couple more. Yeah. If you look at, like, this is now pod seven, you have Kenny Oberg, the Tesserator from Sweden. Chris Pecula is there. <laughs> Guillaume Wafatapa, 2007 Pro Tour Yokohama champion. Tom the Boss Ross <laughs> from Top 8 of Pro Tour Honolulu, 2009. And then even, and we're still all these pods six and twos. Right. So then you've got, how about Conley Woods, Reed Duke, Raf Levy and Jonas Kussler all in what you might call the bottom of the six and two pods. And in fact, Kussler is someone with a draw five, two and one as is Levy. Yeah, and what's important to remember, you know, we've gone down pod seven, pod eight. It's like, oh, that's really deep in the field. But all of these people essentially are at six and two. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a lot of room to climb the standings, even at these lower pods. Yeah, and the important thing there is that, again, it's in the sort of dynamic nature of the pods right. that within this top table, Yes, you've got two eight and O's and six, seven and ones. But remember that half of those eight players are going to go one and two or worse. Meanwhile, at all these other pods, someone's going three and O. Right. So your seven and one, half of those will end up at eight and three or maybe nine and two. At the six twos, you're going to get six players who win those pods and get to nine and two. The churn in the standings on the second morning of a Pro Tour with draft is gigantic. So watch out for that. So that's the leaderboard. We're gonna tell you what pods we're gonna feature later in this show. But what I wanna do now is focus in on the Magic Top 25 Pro Rankings. This is new, it's just debuted. It's a combination of last season's points, which gradually decay as this season's points get given out and they get a combined score. And it's kind of a reflection of who's hot at the moment, who you are going. If you go to a Grand Prix next week, if you go to Louisville, who are you most likely to face at three and O and go, wow, I've got to play him. So right. it's a combination of who's going to be there, who's on the top of their game, who's consistently putting up results over the last 12, 18, 24 months. So let's take a look at the top 25 and we'll show you how they did on day one. You would hope most of them made it into day two. Let's see how they did. So uh, we start off with your number one ranked player. It's Josh Ashley of the United States Team Channel Fireball. How do you do? He is at 4-4. Four, four. So uh, despite being number one in the world right now, essentially number one ranked, uh, he's just got a 50% ranking in this Pro Tour. Yeah, that's not super exciting. Uh, let's take a look at number two. It's also Channel Fireball. Um, the smiling Ben Stark, who of course got inducted into the Hall of Fame his record on day one, Zach. And he is sitting at 5-3, so a little bit better than his teammate Josh Utter Layton, but he's gonna have to work hard to pull out a top eight. Now, the interesting thing about both of those, we said they're on Team Channel Fireball, they are on what we might call the Fireball deck, um, and they have very definitely come to a conclusion about the standard format. Um, I believe, I don't want to give too much away, but I believe that they are single colored and feature mountains pretty much. <laughs> so, somewhat, so that gives you some idea of where they are within the wheel. Um, and it's pretty noticeable that neither of them have a fantastic standard record. And if they're going to win the Pro Tour, well, they're going to need to play a lot of standards. So not sure that bodes terribly well for them. Yeah, at the same time, having talked to a lot of those guys, they're very confident in their deck. They think it was a great choice mm -hmm. today. Uh, and it, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see the diversity of opinions and the way different players approach the field. Okay, let's take a look at the number three ranked player. It's Shahar Shenha, your world champion, of course. He went five and three yesterday. Um, so he has, He's kind of on the edge. You feel if you lose early for your fourth loss, then your tie breaks will be sufficiently bad that you're really up against it. All the five and threes will just be sitting in pods of eight going, I must win my draft, get to eight and three, put the limited away, get my standard deck back out and hope to make a, a deep run. Right. I mean, but like you were talking about, too, I mean, it's a really tremendous opportunity to 3-0 your pod and get right back in the game. 
Absol you know. Absolutely. So Shahar is number three. Number four, we go to Japan. It's Yuya Watanabe, his record. He is also at five and three. Yeah. So he's in some so, good company up at the top of the rankings. Yeah, five, three there. And then number five is Mr. Reed Duke. <laughs> Uh, and he is from Star City Games, um, and he is at six and two overnight. Um, and I think he's sort of been lost in the shuffle a little bit around the excitement of Sam Black and Paul Reitzel, both at eight and oh. But Reed's done, uh, again, a super solid job. One of the top players without a Pro Tour top eight. Seems extraordinary, but he is, of course, the runner-up from the World Championship. Who have we got next? Uh, after Reed, we've got Willie Edel. Mm -hmm. uh, previously to this, four Pro Tour top eights. Right now, he's sitting at five and three. Okay, now, I think this next one is very disappointing. Number seven ranked is Shuhei Nakamura. And he has, well, he's had a terrific day in standard yesterday. Went 4-1 in standard, but... His overall record is four and four, and that tells you that a former player of the year in 2008 with his 22 Grand Prix top eights and five Pro Tour top eights went 0-3 in Theros draft. Zach, I want to ask you, just take a moment away from the rankings to ask you with your inside R&D hat on, if you will, are there certain draft formats that, if you like, lend themselves readily to misfiring in a draft comprehensively where it's very hard to save a draft and suddenly you you go in with a plan and if it doesn't work you're in desperate trouble i think there are i mean there are some formats i think lorwin morning tide was this way right where like a lot of the decks that you draft hinge around like a particular piece or getting a sufficient density of a certain type of card right and you're doing the entire draft thinking that's going to happen but if that just never shows up you're left with a deck that like essentially doesn't do anything and uh that said, I don't know if Theros is one of those formats. Right. I think there's a lot of different ways to play it, but sometimes you're in on a linear strategy and it just doesn't come together. Yeah, and certainly we saw yesterday Andre Prost. Um, right. He was on our first pick, first pack wheel uh, from the draft year, and you can see that. And his first pick was an abhorrent overlord right. um, in the lovely rare slot. Um, now, I'm not saying in any way that the abhorrent overlord contributed to going 0-3, <laughs> um, but certainly, you know, anecdotally, I'm looking forward to going back through the draft year myself and seeing you know, what were his picks from from there because Baron Overlord's a card that's quite tough to get away from. Exactly. So, um, there we are, back with the rankings. Uh, number eight uh, is Mr. Tom Martell, StarCityGames.com again, uh, and he's five and three. You see, first at Grand Prix Indianapolis 2012 and at Pro Tour Gate Crash uh, in this season, uh, five and three. And now, you will notice so far, everyone's in. Everyone's through to day two so far. The top eight are in. But here's number nine, and it's our first casualty on the current top 25 list. Number nine, Eric Froelich, three and five. He actually got to play four day two mm -hmm. at three and four, but uh, lost out, and obviously a, a pretty unexciting day for him. Yeah, I mean, you can't be disappointed to be the first person in these rankings to not make day two. On the other hand, it is a testament to the qualities of these players that, I mean, it's not until we get almost through the top 10 that we're finding someone that didn't make the second day. Yeah. Uh, number 10 is very much in day two. It's Stanislav Sivka, the return to Ravnica Pro Tour champion. Uh, he is at six and two. Um, and then, well, a fairly astonishing one at 11 because there's the smiling Brian Kibler. We wouldn't have got a photo quite like that round about seven o'clock yesterday evening because he went one and five and then went, yeah, you know what? That's the end for now. Don't want to play the last two rounds, thank you. So one and five, and one of the biggest casualties, obviously not just in terms of rankings, but in terms of world magic, are arguably the biggest casualty of day one. However, it may not be a casualty for our audience. Yeah. But uh, he teased gently. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, so, Martin User is your number 12 uh, ranked pro, uh, and he went five and three from the Czech Republic. So, that's another uh, two checks in the top dozen or so right now. Martin User already pr two Pro Tour top eights, but really looking to build on that. He's such a monster on the Grand Prix scene, and he's really trying to get all the way um, at a Pro Tour. And at five and three, he really needs to win his draft pod. So does David Ochoa, our number 30. Team uh, rank pro. He's five and three from Team Channel Fireball. And again, this is kind of like what you've already mentioned with Josh and Ben at four four and five three. It's interesting that you say they still like their deck rather than oh maybe it wasn't the right choice. They still feel it was an excellent choice. So if they can get out of limited with a three and zero here, then maybe they can demonstrate that 
it was the right standard choice. Right. I mean, I think a lot of the conversation now is around Team Star City games because, you know, there's two undefeated players and they're playing both of the Team Star City games decks. Mm -hmm. But that's just day one. And uh, fields in day two tend to look very different from fields on the first day. And so it might be an opportunity for the Channel Fireball deck to really uh, come back with a vengeance. OK, now number 14 is someone who I think will be very disappointed with his day yesterday because he started off so well. I'm pretty sure he went to 3-0 and and has ended up 4-4. Four and -four. This is Craig Wesco, if you like, the defending Pro Tour champion from Dragon's Maze. Number 15, however, had an altogether good day because not only did he go 6-2, and two, which puts him in decent shape within the Team Channel Fireball uh, thing, but it turns out that if you scroll down from that photo, you would get to a hand with a ring on it uh, because Louis Scott Vargas now uh, is a member of the Hall of Fame inducted in the ceremony yesterday. I hope you got a chance uh, to see that. Very, uh, uh, Always a very emotional time and uh, fantastic to pay our respects to one of the true greats of the game and three of the greats in himself. Ben Stark and Billy Jensen. Uh, so that's Luis at now 16. I think today could be a very big day for this young man. Owen Turtonwald currently at six and two. Yeah, Owen, another one of those players with tremendous Grand Prix success, former player of the year, but with only one top eight. We're seeing uh, the potential for a breakout moment for several of these players mm. we've gone through, and Owen at six and two is, is right there in the middle of the pack fighting for those slots. Now, someone who is almost out the door is our number 17 seed. This is Lee Shi Chan of Hong Kong, a gold pro, so he's qualified for all the PT, so he doesn't need to be too worried about that. Won a Grand Prix in my home turf of Birmingham in 2000. 2008, um, but not on a great tear at the moment and just four and four yesterday means that even with eight and oh he's likely though not certain to be on the outside looking in when it comes to tie breaks this field in particular is very very big Zach because of all the silver pros right. who are here with their one shot so that's got to make a difference and then we stay in Asia for number 18 and this is Su Ching Kuo well Su Ching Kuo uh, winner of the World Magic Cup um, for Chinese Taipei of course in 2012, uh, but he will not be making his first Pro Tour Top 8. He has the highest number of Pro Points ever currently in this field without a Pro Tour Top 8, 201 coming in, but it will only be 204 now because he is gone at 3 and 5. Now, the next two, Zach, pretty exciting. Tell us about them. Yeah, so we've got uh, the captain of the French uh, World Magic Cup team last year, Raphael Levy. He is at 5, 2, and 1, the only one of these players we've seen so far with a draw, which is not exactly where you want to be in a field that this, that's this tight. Uh, but Levy, you know, still made day two. He's certainly ahead of the five and three players. He's in a position to put up yet another solid finish, which he's been doing for almost two decades now. OK. Um, and then we've got Makahita Mahara, who's one of my absolute favorite players of all time. Um, it will not surprise me at all to find him in the Hall of Fame, especially if that Pro Tour Top 8 four becomes Pro Tour Top 8 five mm. later today, which, by the way, I fully, fully expect to happen. So that's him destroyed. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> we'll keep that on the record. <laughs> All right, who's next? Uh, we've got Ari Lax, uh, ranked 21. He is also at 5-3. and three. Again, another excellent, excellent player without a Pro Tour top eight to his resume. Ninth place, kind of heartbreaking at Pro Tour return to Ravnica. It was really one of the best decks in the field. But uh, again, he's, he's kind of sitting there toward the bottom middle of the pack, really needs to rattle off a string of wins today. Same deal for number 22. This is Alex Hayne from Canada. He is at 5-3, and three, which means really doesn't have a loss to give in draft. Maybe he can get away with a loss in standard. And then we get to our number 23. This is from Italy, and it's Samuele Estrati. He's down at 4-4, four and four, and so is our number 24, and that's Matt Costa from Star City Games. Had a chance to chat with Matt on the eve of the, the PT, and he was one of the people who felt truly blessed to be in the Star City team, um, just to hang out with so many <laughs> great Magic players for so long. Um, you know, just watch great players at work, just be part of the conversations. It isn't even, uh, and Zach, you've been part of some terrific testing teams. In a way, it isn't even about the playing of the Magic. It's just 
using your ears and paying attention to what people are saying. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so many times the value of a team like that is for you to be able to sit back and really just watch playtest games, listen to how people are thinking about the format. And uh, for Matt, you know, Matt's still a pretty young guy. Team Star City is, you know, stacked with Hall of Famers. It, the preparation he's doing is not just for an individual tournament, but for the course of his entire Magic career. And it's really amazing to be a part of such a great collective of minds. So then we have the pair who are tied for 25th currently. Next week's rankings, not going to be the same, I guarantee, because even Flock tied for 25th. He is 5-3 and three, looking for his first Pro Tour top eight. Who else is tied 25th? Yeah, that man, 8-0, Sam Black, five Grand Prix top eights, team world champion, of course, with Paul Cheon and Mike Jacob at Memphis in 2008. And there, the gold pro is really making a run. He is joint leader at 8-0 with Paul Rietzel. OK, so that's your top 25 coming in. The rankings will change radically. Keep your eye on at MTG Daily. Um, for the update for that. I think that goes out Wednesday, uh, maybe Thursday of each week. So, what about some of the other groups of players? How did they do yesterday? We've sort of looked at the top 25, but there are lots of sort of little subgroups. And you think, well, how did the Hall of Famers do? How did people who've played the most PTs do? Why don't we take a look at some of the groups and we'll see those now. So let's take a look. First of all, um, there you see, by the way, the top 25, the full order. Let's see how many people didn't make it in. Brian Kibler didn't make it in. Eric Froelich didn't make it in. Su Chin Kuo at three and five. Yep, I think that's it. So it turns out 22 of the 25 still alive here on day two. So look, there's your top 10. Pro Tours played. Now, most of these are members of the Hall of Fame. In fact, every single one of them <laughs> is a member of the Hall of Fame. Uh, Raph Levy up there with a ridiculous 80 Pro Tours played. He's 5-2 and 1. Uh, obviously, the best record there is John Finkel. DNP, by the way, down the bottom, just stands for did not play. He was not here uh, this weekend. Yelga Vigasma took this one off. Um, Frank Carsten snuck in at 4-4. Four and four. Nassif just missed out. The draw cost him three wins and a draw rather than four wins, four losses. Uh, Rob Doherty did a debt tech for us yesterday at 6-2. and two. Antoine and Olivier Ruel both here. It's Antoine um, who has the whip hand at the moment at 6-2. and two. Darwin Castle, a couple of draws. Um, and then Bram Snetvangers in at four and four. So that's the top 10 Pro Tours played. What about Premier Play record? So this is a minimum of 100 matches across Grand Prix and Pro Tours. So it's a combined ranking. And you see up at the top there, he was four and four on day one. But Zach, what a year it's been for the Rookie of the Year from Chile, Felipe Tapia Becerra. Yeah, I mean, Felipe Tabi Becerra is 74.5% win percent. I mean, that is the mind-blowing number. Yeah, I, I mean, just as a benchmark, we reckon that at 60% at either GP or PT right. level, that's pretty good. 60 and above in Pro Tours, definitely very good. GPs, maybe you want to be closer to sort of 63 for real excellence. But the best of all time tend to be 65, 66 in this combined ranking. So Becerra, yes, he's still young in his right. career. But if we look again at that graphic, 74%. He's winning three out of every four. No wonder he's being successful. Also on that list, Andrew Cantalana didn't play this weekend. Jeremy Dezani, you're going to see his name a lot in the next few minutes, with good reason, not least because he's 7-1. and one. Frank Scarron, the Pro, uh, Grand Prix Charlotte winner, 5-3. and three. Um, The X means that they gave up at some point. So Marcio yeah. Carvalho won a match and at some point went, I'm done for the day. Kai, 6-2, 5-3 for Shahar, we know. Chase Kovac is, has a very high Grand Prix win percentage, mm. by the way, and Seth Manfield down there at 4-4. Four and four. So what about the formats that we're actually using? Well, how about standard? And again, Felipe Tapia Becerra right up at the top, even crazier. This is 78.8. So right now, I would suggest to you that Everyone will be hoping he doesn't come out of draft 3-0 and because he's very likely to go at least 4-1, and if not 5-0, and when we get back to standard. What other names there sort of uh, stand out for you? Well, I mean, of course, we're looking at Shahar. Again, nearly 75%, kind of 
totally unheard of. Jeremy Dizani, we see him again. He, I think, is one of the most exciting players on earth right now. Tremendous yeah. success in the Grand Prix circuit. Would love to see him do well under the lights today on the Pro Tour stage. And then I, I'm excited to see uh, Paulo Vitor Damo de Rosa back with a really, really solid record. Yeah. Um, not the most exciting season last year for him, although no. still certainly not unreasonable. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back really with a vengeance, positioned at 6-2, and two, very well set up for success today. Okay, so let's move on from standard and we'll go to limited. Again, this is across Grand Prix and Pro Tours. Again, Dizani is in the top 10 there. You see Frank Scarron. Kelvin Young wasn't here. Um, Marcio Carvalho, you've already seen, dropped out. Robin Dolor as well. Yuya Watanabe makes an appearance on this top 10 list. And, so, and I actually want to talk about Tom Ross. Okay. You know, he's sitting there at the top of this list. Tom reminds me a lot of a really good friend of mine for a long time ago named Neil Reeves. Yep. A kind of guy that, uh, you know, I mean, Tom has a top eight, but a, a lot of players who are really good and really know what they're doing think very highly of Tom. You know, perhaps yeah. more than he's been under the spotlights or perhaps more than his, uh, you know, pro tour record would attest. Rock solid player, really knows what he's talking about and, and a really good guy too so it's yeah. uh, you know it, it's a testament to that ability when we see how high his limited win percentage he, he is a terrific guy and maybe he's one of those players who was sort of robbed of the desire in some ways mm. because he's super smart magic comes pretty easily to right. him um, and I, I've certainly had conversations with him where he's been like you know I love magic but it, it isn't necessarily something that he needs right um, and a lot of the best players need it in a super driven way. And it's very interesting. I look at Brad Nelson, who's someone I've obviously had a lot of contact with, literally wrote the book on him, um, <laughs> where he was someone who needed it, right. became player of the year, stopped needing it, plummeted. And I think he's needing it again. And he's yeah. six and two right now and very much has the game face on, the sort of famous Brad Nelson game face. Uh, he's someone I think to watch today as well. All right, now we've looked at limited, but what about what have you done for me lately? Let's look at 2014, as it were, the 2013-2014 Premier Play win percentage. This season, with a minimum of 30 matches, because we're still quite young in the year, so some of these numbers are a little soft um, in the sense of statistically pleasing, but Neil Oliver, 87.9%, I beg your pardon, he has basically of course, he won the largest event in Magic history at Grand Prix Las Vegas. He was also a Grand Prix runner-up. The guy is just essentially unbeatable. But at Pro Tour level, where he's making his debut this time, five and three. Lots of five and threes on that board. Lucas Xiao uh, from Canada um, there in second place. Rasmus Björklund, Mats Torres. A lot of Europeans on this mm -hmm. list. Alexander Hain again from Canada. And then I love the fact that you have Josh McLean and Reed Duke nestled next to each other. Both have won a GP. Both have finished second at a GP to each to other. <laughs> which is just extraordinary. And then the two Hall of Famers, Billy Jensen and Ben Stark. All right. Now, it may not have escaped your attention, those of you, you know, pay attention to coverage, <laughs> that people turn up in teams at these events. You know, so you get, sometimes you get three Brits testing together, or maybe you get the Brits and the Norwegians with a couple of Scots thrown in. Maybe you get a whole bunch of French players with some of the Belgians. They might go together. Sometimes you might have a Zach Hill and some Belgians, <laughs> um, if you're going a little bit historic. Um, but there's no doubt that although there are lots of teams here, there are two undoubted super teams, and those are Channel Fireball and StarCityGames.com. Rather pleasingly, they both have about the same number of players in each, around about 15. Yeah. So we can have a little comparison at how the two super teams did on day one. So up we come. Let's take a look at Team Channel Fireball. So the records. Pat Cox, 5-3. and three. Paolo's doing nicely at 6-2. and two. Eric Froelich gone. User 5-3. Carsten pretty much out of the running at 4-4. Four, four. Brian Kibler, as we know, did not make it into day two. Shuhei pretty much gone at 4-4. Four, four. Matt Nass, David Ochoa needing wins in draft. Brock Parker pretty much gone. Luis at 6-2, which is great. Shahar, 5-3. Ben Stark, 5-3. Both needing draft wins. Josh Sutter-Layton, 
almost out the door. And for the second Pro Tour running, not even seeing Conley Woods. I haven't physically seen Conley Woods this weekend. <laughs> I mean, chained to the desk. Um, and he's six and two and quietly ready to make another push towards the top eight. The interesting thing there, quite a few people gone, quite a few people out of contention, and no one better than six and two. No one better than six and two, but I think only two people who didn't make day two. So a pretty good conversion rate sure. for Channel Fireball, uh -huh. just not at the top of the standings. But today might be an opportunity to change all that. Yeah, especially as you look at all those five and threes and you think, right. I haven't checked exactly where uh, the likes of Martin User and David Ochoa and Shaha and Ben Star I haven't quite checked exactly where they are um, in terms of right. um, the list. But um, let's let's move on and take a look at StarCityGames.com. Uh, um, and here we go with Sam Black, 8-0. Kai, 6-2. Pat Chabin, the innovator, 6-2. Matt Costa, 4-4, four four, pretty much gone. Reed Duke, 6-2. John Finkel, 7-1. Billy Jensen, 6-2. Tom Martell, needing wins, 5-3. Nassif is gone. Brad Nelson, 6-2. Rietzel, 8-0. Matt Sperling, 5-3, and then Owen Turtonwild, 6-2. Now, I haven't actually counted them all up, but anecdotally, Zach, I think we can say it's advantage SCG. Yeah, I completely agree with that. They've got both the undefeated finishers. They've got two extremely good decks, a lot more 6-2s, a lot more players very well positioned to make a run at the top eight. Uh, at the end of day one, yeah, I think Star City is a pretty clear winner. Okay, so... That's just where some of the names have fallen. Of course, you can check out Daily NTG. You can find out everything about all your favorite friends from around the world, how they did on day one. Now, it's in the nature, again, of the schedule of the PT that right now we've had slightly more standard than limited. We're about to change that over the next three to four hours, and it'll go 4-5, 5-5, and then the last round of Limited will push Limited ahead of Standard in terms of importance. So a little balance tilting towards Limited at the end of 11 rounds. But then, everything from then on hinges on constructed play. So, Zach, while we wait um, for the round to start, and we're sort of heading in that direction, the players have been building their decks for the last half hour or so. We're not far away from pairings. But I want to touch on what we saw yesterday, set the scene a little bit for standard, and we looked at the four pillars of standard. Uh, and we're going to begin with the Selesnia deck. We've got that up on the big board. You've got the likes of Fleece Mainline, Boon Sater, uh, Trostani we've seen, and Advent of the Worm. What was your take on Selesnia yesterday? I think we had uh, Rob Doherty in to talk about green white yeah we had rob and his deck was really interesting had a lot of one and two ofs you know the thing about the green white deck is that it's incredibly consistent it has very potent threats all the way up the curve things to do with its mana late game and fleece main lion and boon Seder, and just a really solid choice this weekend i think it was the the third or fourth most popular deck um, you know, the, its weakness that you know, normally green-white has that it can't remove permanents, Celestian Charms actually takes care of that. So I think it's a great choice for the week. Okay, let's look at Red Deck Wins next, um, which we had a chance to look at yesterday as well. You can check out all the deck techs on Daily MTG, the likes of Fire Drinker Sata, Removal and Lightning Strike, and Magma Jet, and Fnatic of Mogus. My lord, I saw that do some work yeah, yesterday. Yeah, we've seen Fnatic deal upwards of seven damage when cast. Interestingly, with Magma Jet, we've actually seen a lot of shocks in favor of of Magma Jet because the mana efficiency has just been more important than Scrying too. So not necessarily what you'd expect, but that's why you show up and actually play games and don't theory craft all day. All right. Yeah, I don't do much theory crafting <laughs> myself. Uh, so that's Red Deck Wins. Now we get to Gruel Midrange, um, which is a really interesting deck. You've got the likes of Ember Swallower, Sada Hedonist, Pelucranos World Eater, and Xenagos the Reveler. Yeah, I really think Pelucranos, one of the breakout cards of the tournament, we've seen it doing great work today, especially against the Blue Devotion deck, which has a lot of small, uh, lower toughness creatures, and can't really kill a Pelucranos. Another great combo we've seen is Pelucranos with Wasteland Viper, which can give it Death Touch. Okay, now, you, now I'm going to get you to do yeah. this slowly, because ah. someone told me about this, and I was like, <laughs> it's the what now? The, the what? This card and this yeah, card. Yeah, so do do this whole thing for me. So what you do, you attack with your Pelucranos. Right, okay. Your opponent may or may not block, mm -hmm. but then you use the Blood Rush ability on Wasteland Viper to give it plus one, plus two, and importantly, Death Touch. Okay, so Pelucranos now has plus one, plus two. Yes. And Death Touch. And Death Touch. Okay. 
Two toughness is matters because it's probably not gonna die. So then you use its ability and you just deal one damage to as many creatures as you can. Right. And that one damage is gonna kill all of them. Because they are all because death, they have death touch damage. Touch. Exactly. Right. So it's a little two card combo, of both cards that you wanna be playing anyway that can completely turn the tide around in a creature based mirror match. Been really powerful this weekend. That is that is pretty savage, actually. Now, that, now I feel a bit sad I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> Mind you, I did get to see the green white mirror I am. with 113 life on one side and 132 life on the other, and the player with 113 life having no chance at all <laughs> because there was an Ajani about to go, I'm going to make 132 Good 2 2 cats. Nest. Yes. Now, I'd quite like to see that on camera later. I've got to be honest. Green, white mirrors, it's the way forward. Death by um, cat. Death by cat, indeed. Meow. <laughs> so then we get, that's for the friends at home. Uh, so then let's take a look at Esper Control. Um, and this is a kind of, I would almost call this the default deck of the format because you go, hey, what are the control colors? It's black, it's blue, it's white. Hey, what does black, blue, and white get? It gets planeswalkers, it gets quality lands, it gets removal and counter magic. And it kind of feels like a lot of the field has defaulted to this. Yeah, I mean, I think it was the most popular deck on day one. A lot of players had concerns about the deck's mana base, but in exchange, you get a lot of very powerful cards. You get exactly the kind of removal you want. You get resistance to the regular blue white decks, which sort of leaned very heavily on detention sphere, not a lot of other ways to remove creatures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the, one of the breakout cards of the tournament in Ashiok, uh, a Planeswalker that people were saying, you know, when the set came out, eh, I don't know how powerful this is, mm. really earned a lot of respect over the last couple of weeks. So, yeah, I, I think Esper is kind of the, I know all these cards are good. I was kind of playing it last year. Probably not going to go wrong by playing that deck. In this yeah, tournament. I know Christian Calcano is on that. He's at six and two uh, overnight. Good luck to him. So let's take a look at our leaderboard one more time. This is what you're looking at. This is what's about to shift seismically over the next three rounds. Rietzel and Black at eight and zero. Oh. The seven and ones. Dizani for Europe. Japan's Mahara. Germany's Tajak. The Czech Republic. Have Yaklowski from the United States. The greatest ever. John Finkel. Canada's David Kaplan, Pierre Dajon of France, Raymond Perez on debut, Alexei Shasov on debut, Kentaro Yamamoto, Matei Zatelkai, Carlos Duarte on debut, Michael Durzo on debut. Four players in pod two are in their first pro tour. And then you've got Johnston heading the six and twos, the cavalcade of legends that sit just behind our scoreboard. Who are we going to focus on um, in this next three rounds those two pods there because the left hand side is the pod you've already taken a look at you've got sam black tajak kaplan finkel yaklovsky paul rietzel who we watch draft with Dizani and mahara and then on the right of your screen we are going to see who emerges from that six and two incredible bun fight highlighted by the new hall of famer louis scott vargas plus a ton of supporting cast peter ingram and luke southworth you are the underdogs on that table, and no mistake, best of luck to both of you. And best of luck to all of them, because it's time to settle down and shuffle them up, because here comes round nine of Pro Tool Theros 2013.